Good evening, everybody. This is Mike Cooper at CalvaryChapel.Valve, and we're back here on a Wednesday evening to our, for our midweek Bible study. Uh, we're, uh, we're continuing on in Ecclesiastes tonight, and we'll be in Ecclesiastes 8, and the verses tonight will be 2 to 15. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we can come here, Lord, and uh, worship you by studying your word, Lord. We pray that you'll teach us tonight, Lord. Give us wisdom and discernment and help us to understand your word that we can take these things and use them in our lives, Lord, to draw closer to you and walk in your ways. So I pray that you'll bless this tonight, Lord. Just take this from me and speak to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the passages to which we come to today in chapter 8 of the, book of the book of Ecclesiastes deals directly with a current phenomenon that's going on in our lives. And that is the growing resistance to government control of, of individual lives. Especially as that control includes the right not to wear face masks and socially distance. We're getting a little tired with that, I know. You may not have realized that this ancient book deals with that very problem, but it does. As we look at the passage, we hope to shed some light on who is right. Those who say we're not going to do it, or those who say it's not a task to wear a mask. The searcher's comment on this emerges from a section which deals with the question of how rightly to view good and evil. We have already seen that prosperity is not always good, nor is adversity always bad. In chapter 7, we saw that despite the phony righteousness which abounds in religious circles of our day, there is a true wisdom that can be found. Today, in chapter 8, beginning in verse 2, we'll see that. Despite injustice and government, Nevertheless, there are proper powers which government yields. Many of you will recognize immediately that that is exactly in line with the Apostle Paul's word in Romans 13 about the powers of government. I commend that parallel passage, the first seven verses of Romans 13, for your own study. Here in chapter 8, though, in verses 2 through 5 of the NIV, it says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, you can say to him, What are you doing? Whoever obeys, his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. So in this passage, the searcher, King Solomon himself, head of the state of the nation of Israel, is teaching us three spiritual reasons why we should obey the government. The first of these reasons he sets forth in verse 2. Obey because you are a citizen of that government. This is, by, this is what he means. Because of your secret oath, or sacred oath. Every citizen of the United States and the Philippines has taken, in some form or another, an oath of allegiance to support the government. If you're a naturalized citizen, you actually took an oath like that when you became a citizen. If you're a natural born citizen, as most of us are, you reflected that oath wherever you said the Pledge of Allegiance. In the U.S., it's I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which it just stands, and on and on and on and on. In the Philippines, I love the Philippines, my land of birth, home of my race. race. I am protected by it and aided, and on and on and on. This is what is referred to in chapter 80 as a sacred oath. 
One translation puts this, keep the king's command as though it were an oath unto God. That's in the King James Version. This underscores the seriousness of citizenship. That by virtue of sharing the blessings of government in a nation such as ours, we are also responsible to obey the proper powers and the laws of that government. You know, since I'm an American citizen, it's still my responsibility to obey the laws of the Philippines because I'm living here. This is the first reason this passage teaches why we should obey the government. There is also a clear suggestion here that this is not always going to be pleasant. Verse 2 implicates that because you are sacred, because of your sacred oath, you shouldn't be dismayed. That is, there will be times when obeying the government will not be very convenient, when it will be interfere with other things you want to do. For instance, if to be, to be summoned for jury duty just as you are living for vacation isn't very convenient, is it? Or if you're hit by a zoning restriction in regard to some change you want to make in your home, or some building that you want to erect, that's not very pleasant either. Nor is paying your taxes when you feel that they're a heavy burden. This is a recognition that to the ordinary citizen, obedience is not based upon convenience, but rather it is a responsibility we owe because, as Paul says in Romans 13, government is ordained by God. That's Romans 13, 1. Now granted, sometimes this can be unpleasant. Although there are times when we all agree that with Will Rogers when he said, we ought to be grateful that we don't have as much government as we paid for. But the theory and the principle of government is clearly established in scripture. A second reason why we should obey government appears in verses three through four. We are to obey the government because it has power to compel us to. Verse three says, do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? No, we don't have a king here, here in the Philippines or in the U.S., at least we don't call him that. But we do have a head of state, and he represents the power and the authority of government. There's a recognition that the government does have the right to compel, the right to force. Again, Paul restricts or reflects this in Romans 13, where it says in verse 4, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. That's at 13.4 of the NIV, Romans. The head of state has the right to do that. No more eloquent or adequate statement of this is right has ever been made in that it contained the words of the great documents that underlie our American liberty, the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. Do you remember how the Constitution begins? We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general warfare or welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The Philippines is similar. We, the sovereign Filipino people, imploring the aid of the Almighty God in order to build a just and humane society and establish a government that shall embody our ideals and aspirations, promote the, good, uh, the common good, conserve the, and develop patrimony, and secure ourselves and our posterity, posterity the blessings of independence and democracy under the rule of the law and a regime of truth, justice freedom, 
equality and peace, do ordain and promulgate this Constitution. The closing words of the Declaration of Independence for both countries are likewise filled with references to the purpose and function of government. This is our Founding Fathers recognize that the scriptures so clearly state that government is ordained of God and has power to function as such and the citizen is responsible to obey not only because of his oath of allegiance but also because the government has power to compel. And then the third reason flows out of that. It's in verse 5a Whoever obeys his, obeys his command will come to no harm. You know, it's a very wise thing to obey the government. This obedience uh, is to be taken, isn't to be taken for granted. How and when is another matter. You know, we'll look into that in just a moment. But another reason for obedience is that we will escape additional harassment from governing powers. One of my sisters once got a speeding ticket, an older sister. She ignored it, thinking that the matter would never come up again. You know, I know that there are others today that ignore such tickets. The original fine for the speeding ticket was, ticket was $25. This was a long time ago. But because she ignored it, some months later she got an addition notice saying the fine had now been advanced to $145. It was beyond what she could pay. With the clear implication that the longer she waited, the larger the fine would grow. She eventually ended up paying the fine by going to jail for a while. That's what this verse is talking about. You know, my sister learned a very necessary lesson. The government has the power to compel and the way to escape that harassment is to obey the government and pay the fine. So the right of government to compel is clearly established here. Obedience is required unto God. And then it says in verses 5b uh, through 6, And a wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For this there, there is a proper time and a procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. That takes us back to the passage in chapter 3 where we are told that there is a time and a place for everything. That in God's great overall plan for every individual's life is there is provision made for sorrow and for rejoicing, for fears and for laughter, for war and for peace. Here are we are reminded of that. Every matter has its time and its way. But we are given certain freedom, and this is the time, the way, this is the time and the way we obey. The worst man's trouble seems to suggest that it's not always easy to know how to obey or when one should obey. There are many factors that would influence that, especially in this matter, that we are facing more and more the matter of COVID restrictions. There are some in America that are violently opposed to this. The fact that it's difficult is also part of God's program. As believers, we ought to understand that it's not always easy to know what God wants. He doesn't want it to be easy. We're not robots. Given orders to go here or there, having no choice at all in the matter, God clearly doesn't want those kinds of sons and daughters. He tells us that. Yet that's really what we're asking for when we say, God, show me what you want me to do and I'll do it. In other words, compel me. Give me orders and I'll carry them out. God doesn't do that. We often struggle, evaluate, weigh, think and puzzle over what we should do. God wants it that way. That's part of his plan. That time 
or the time is not always left up to us. Sometimes the law requires a certain time schedule. You know, if you have to register for the draft, you have a certain length of time in which you must do it. You have to pay your taxes, you have a certain deadline to make to do that. But the searcher says that a way can be found by the wise man. Though it's not wrong to take advantage of provisions and hardship relief, such as might be included in a draft law, for instance, nevertheless, the way to obey can be found in every individual circumstances is one is walking in the wisdom of God. Another factor which influences us is found in verse 7, where it says, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? That raises the matter of uncertainty as to the results of obedience and to government. One of the reasons we're not left up to our own devices is as to whether we are going to obey the government or not is that we don't always know what God intends to work out by means of our obedience. He may have blessings for us that will come out in that relationship of obedience we cannot foresee. As a rebellious young man of 17, I wasn't going to school like I should have. So as idle and getting, to, getting into trouble, I ended up having to make a decision before a judge to pay a heavy fine or go into the military where my decisions were made for me. So I enlisted in the army. Although I was unsure whether I was doing the right thing or not, I felt I ought to join. What I didn't understand or realize was that the action I took would open a door for stability in life that I never would have found without strict obedience of the pledge that I made to serve my country in that way. Furthermore, I didn't know that. I didn't know I would be granted the GI Bill of Rights, which would give me money to pay for college. For not only me, but for my wife and others. In verse 8, the searcher faces a strict, a very strictly or a very sticky point, I'm sorry. The possibility of losing your life and obeying the government is clearly faced here. Verse eight, as no one has power over the wind to contain it. So no one has power over the time of their death. As one who is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. This is a remarkable verse here. Three things are clearly stated. First, death is holy in God's hands. He can take someone through the most terrible time, the most terrible bombardment, and preserve his life, even through hundreds around him that may fall right, just right around him. Many a soldier or sailor has said to himself, why did I survive? when all my buddies were killed. What does God have for me that he wouldn't allow me to live? I've had that, to, I've had to ask that question of myself. As dear friends went down in Vietnam, there was a time when I was transferred from one crew to another, and then half of them died, the crew that I left, half of them died in a rock attack on our position. I've had to say to myself, why wasn't I still on that crew? Many a soldier has had to face the same fact that God is saying to him, I want to use your life. God is able to preserve it. The verse clearly states that death is wholly in his hands. No man has the power to retain his spirit when God calls it home. No one has the authority to choose the day of his death. That is entirely in God's hands. That's one of the great encouraging things that a Christian who is facing military service ought to consider. The second point 
that this first state is that there is no discharge in time of war. War is an all-out effort by a nation to preserve something of integrity and value. And as such, it requires the wholehearted commitment of all its citizens. There's no way out. I once watched a movie, telefi a movie on a television. It was a television film. It was a movie at the same time, though. It was called The Execution of Private Solvik. It's a true story of the only soldier since the Civil War to be executed for desertion. This very likable young man who had had a rough time in his life had finally found happiness with his new wife. And then he was drafted and put into battle. He was so shaken by that experience that he refused to fight any longer. He laid down his gun and ran away. Finally, he was arrested and tried for desertion. It was evident on the film that everyone involved in the government standpoint was anxious to preserve his life. Yet it became very clear that to allow him to escape would demoralize the whole system and open the door to, for thousands of others to refuse to face the demands of battle. It was a unanimous decision in court, after court, that he should be executed. Finally, his life was taken. Testimony to what scripture here declares. There is no discharge from war. Whether a nation is facing a time of danger, it is the duty of every citizen to come to his defense. Yet the verse goes on to say this doesn't justify any kind of wicked military violence when it says so the wickedness. That is the context of military violence. Wicked disobedience to the laws of life will not release those who practice it. A soldier can be as guilty of murder as any private citizen. He can't disobey the laws of justice while he's wearing a uniform and while he's engaged in combat. This first recognized the fact that wicked violence is not justified. It seems as though, as though someone in any war that is brought or fought ends up being charged with war crimes. That's the typical hatred for others and God doesn't, he doesn't allow it. You know, many perhaps are uncomfortable at this point. You're probably asking yourselves, does that mean that government is always right? Don't governments do wrong at times? The searcher faces it in this next section in verse 9, where it says, all this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. There is an honest recognition of the fact there is evil in government. Man loads, lords it over others to his own hurt. A guy by the name of John Kenneth Galbraith put this very aptly when he said, Under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it is exactly the reverse. Therefore, he recognized the universality of evil. All governments are evil, but there is, there, but where, where does the evil come from? It doesn't, it doesn't mean that government itself is wrong. Government comes from God. The scriptures, both Old and New Testament alike, tell us that. But evil in government arises from the evil of fallen man living in a fallen world. Who of us is free of evil? Who of us can claim absolute innocence for all that we do? No one. There is none righteous, the searcher found. There is no one who God does or who does not do evil. There is no government, therefore, that doesn't have evil within it. 
He gives two very flagrant examples of this in verses 10, for, 20, 10 through 11, where it says, Then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. You know, you've been to a funeral home of some prominent uh, government leader at the time. A man whom everybody knew was a wretch and a reprobate. Even though outwardly he appeared to be holy and righteous as he went in and out of the temple. But at this his funeral, he was being praised, exalted, glorified. None of his evil deeds were mentioned. That is evil. There was an example of this in the death of President Brezhnev of the Soviet Union. You know, he personally gave the order of the, for the invasion of Afghanistan. That started a long time ago, and they've had problems since then. Been over 30 years, I believe now. And for the destruction of millions of innocent people in various parts of the world. But none of this was mentioned at his funeral. Rather, he received glowing tributes and was buried as a hero in the Soviet Union. We don't need to point the finger at Russia. We do the same. You know, we have a lot of wretches who are buried in honorable graves, who are remembered as great leaders, yet they were wicked and violent men. I'm reminded of the story of the woman who was at the funeral of her husband who was, who he had been a notorious wretch and a criminal. On hearing the eloquent eulogy of him, what a wonderful man he was and so forth, she said to her son, go up and see if that's really your father in that coffin. The second example is found in verse 11 where it says when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. What an honest, accurate observation of human life. We find abundant examples today of delays in justice were permit, were, which permit crime to increase and criminals to be encouraged. You know, there's a lot going on in the United States right now. There's the, the trial of uh, the officer that killed George Floyd police officer. He's on trial for murder. It's in the jury right now. People are waiting out there. People are gathered around the courthouse waiting to see what they're going to do. Whether they're going to let this guy off when he blatantly murdered him. They're waiting to see what's going to do. I'm afraid of what they're going to do if he, if he isn't convicted. It wouldn't be right. As far as I can see. You know, when justice is delayed or circumvented in any way, when judges turn loose criminals for technicalities, when it's clear that they are guilty of outrageous crimes, this only encourages more crime. This is a clear picture of the evil that can be present in government. Nevertheless, the searcher finds cause for patience and the twofold promise that follows in verses 12 through 14, where it says, although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. He clearly admits this. But two things encourage him here. One. God will preserve his own despite what happens to their bodies. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not fear those who kill the body, but it cannot cure the, kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. 
as in Matthew 10, 28. That is, the claims of God take precedence over the threats of mankind. We are to walk in the light of that. God is able to take care of his own. In God's eyes, what happens to our bodies is not nearly as significant as what is happening to us. Who we are. Other than this tent that we're in. Those who walk in fear before God we have looked at this word, fear, which means love, respect, honor, and willingness to obey, will be kept by God regardless of what happens to their bodies. But second, God will judge the wrong in his own time. Though a sinner seems to get away with murder and does the same thing a hundred times, Nevertheless, God is watching and accounting will be made. Though the rewards of life seem to be reversed at times, wicked men get what the righteous ought to have. Righteous men get what the wicked deserve. Nevertheless, the promise is that the wicked shall not prolong his days like a shadow. That's an interesting phrase here that I think refers to the wicked man's influence after his death. Life prolonged like a shadow is not real life. It is the influence of a man after his death. Reading through the course of history, is a, you know, it's remarkable that though they have been praised and honored during their lives, following their deaths, notoriously wicked men are always revealed to have been what they really were. Adolf Hitler and all the Nazis who were associated with him are now despised and abhorred for the most, in the most part of the world. They have not been able to prolong their days like a shadow. God works in life to bring truth and justice to light. So the searcher comes to the true conclusion. This is where this book returns again and again in verse 15 where it says, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life that God has given them under the sun. Don't misunderstand this. It's not justification for living in it get up now or say, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. That philosophy is based upon the lie, the illusion that enjoyment comes from pleasant circumstances. You know, if this book is searching for any one thing, it is telling us that that's not true. Enjoyment doesn't come from happy, pleasant circumstances where everything is going the way we like it. That's what the world believes. That's what underlies all the television commercials of our day, the magazine ads and so forth. No, according to this book, enjoyment is a gift of God which can accompany men even in difficult and hard circumstances. That is why he encourages us in it. True enjoyment, true commitment or contentment does it come from having everything the way you like it? It comes no matter what you're going through. as a gift from the glory of God who in relationship with you is able to give you peace and contentment in your heart in the midst of the pressures, the problems, and the dangers of life. Surely this is what the Apostle Paul meant in Philippians. Where he said, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether real fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. That's in Philippians 4.12. What secret, he tells us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in verse 13. 
It's, it, it is that inner strengthening. My relationship with the living God was the secret of contentment. Whether you're abased or whether you're bound, the realization is that a loving Father is working out strange and inscrutable purposes, which you can't always guess at or estimate because of the difficult problems and circumstances which you're always undergoing. Some of you may be going through such times right now. Some of you young men may be facing the matter of a draft registration or afraid of what will happen. It's not convenient. It interrupts the affairs of life. But there are a lot of things like that. Accidents can do that. Disease can do that. Life must be taken the way it is, day to day. The glory of the scriptures is that they don't try to evade life, to put a veil over the veil, to doll it up or dress it up to make it look different. Scriptures faces life just the way it is, but tells us that God has provided an answer. And that answer is found in those who know how to walk before him, to love him, to fear him to trust him and to rest their lives in his hands. You know, this doesn't excuse us from the, scr the struggles of life or from the need to make decisions, but it does reassure us that those who walk in that way will find a source of contentment and satisfaction that is the gift of the God of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your faithful dealings with us, Lord. How, like children, we are so little understanding life, our life, so often confused, so many times bewildered by what we face, sometimes resentful, sometimes angry, because it's not all working out the way we thought. Forgive us and help us to trust, to know, to learn and to realize afresh that your word is always true, that you will indeed be to us what you promised to be as we trust and obey, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.